Okay, uh, in theory, we're live. Who could say? I don't know. Uh, apparently, Nightbot is misbehaving, so I will give it a encouraging uh, tap, and hopefully it will function now. Come on, Nightbot, do your job. All right. And hey, everyone, uh, say hello to me if you want me to say hello to you. I give you one minute to comply. So have, have like, for those of you who've actually gone out and, and looked at Beetlejuice, is it, like, just in your mind, like, really dim, like, visibly totally different now? It's really noticeable, I thought. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite amazing. And apparently, like, another, like, right now it's at, like, 1.5. It gets to 1.6. It becomes the third brightest star in the constellation. Yeah, and isn't it like only in the top 30 bright stars now? Yeah, yeah, as opposed yeah, to yeah. like top 10. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is just amazing. Um, but it doesn't mean what it's going it? to explode. I am not in any way, shape, or form saying that it's going to explode. It totally. better not, because this is the middle of the rainy season for me, and I, <laughs> we've had cloudy <laughs> nights. Oh, oh, no. so yeah. It's been snowing here, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> at, at least it's an object that we both can see. So from from both oh, hemispheres, true, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I always like to lord over the you Southerners, our, you know, <laughs> galaxies that we get to see. And then, of course, you guys get to rejoin with things like the Omega Cluster and the large and small Magellanic Cloud. So, but this, we all can see it. All right, I'm going to say hi to a bunch of people. Hello to Astro B, Christian Woodland, David Fairweather, Horizon Brave, Ian Farkeron, James Haney, John Victor, Johnny J, Johnny Zed, Kevin Ayers, Kevin N, Larry Beckham, Nancy Graziano, Neil Yu, Paranor, Pick and Duck, Rich Wilson, Sir Goosey, The Field Lab, Troy G, Wayne Johnson, and Zapfan Zapfan. Hey, everyone. So before we actually get into today's episode, I want to um, let you know that literally the moment I finish doing the weekly space hangout with these fine folks, I'm going to abandon them and go and do a star party with Skylius over her channel on Twitch. So we've got the, the f new uh, updated Rasa 11 inch with the beautiful uh, full color camera, takes just incredible pictures. And so we're going to do live stream telescopery I will be your DJ to the night sky until, uh, I don't know, till morning. So, um, no, for like a couple of hours, until I get sleepy. I'm an old man. Um, so join us after this. So just go to, I'm sure someone will put a link in the, in the comments, but go to uh, twitch.tv slash cares and that will go on. I'll be there probably 30 minutes after the weekly space hangout, and then you can join us. join us there. I think I won't shamelessly self promote that in the podcast version because it will have already happened. And we don't have a time travel device yet. Um, <laughs> Canadians, we took all the snow on the planet. Yeah, we we had uh, we had quite the snowfall. Have you seen? Do you see what happened over on the east coast in Nova Scotia? In, yeah. Well, yeah, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. People yeah, yeah. Were, had all these hilarious things where they opened up their door and all there was was snow. Just I saw this. Yeah. I just can't imagine. You know, Florida, I mean, I've seen snow once in my life. You know? Floor to ceiling <laughs> snow. You open up the garage door and it's just a wall of snow. Now, to be fair, the the winds were blowing snowdrifts up in the front of people's mm. houses and stuff. We got about, we got about two feet here. Really? Yeah. And, and it was actually pretty cold and sort of the nice dry powdery stuff. And then mm. it turned to rain and it just turned into this horrible gloop that's still everywhere. Mm. And that's the one that like knocks trees over and drops people's roofs and things like that. But no, that happens here. Yeah. Yeah. And also, uh, the royal family uh, moved to my island. So, um, you having him over yet for dinner? Or no, what? no, no, but they're, <laughs> you know, they're only three hours away. So, oh. you know, have him on the show next week. Yeah, have him on the show. Yeah, for sure. Mm. <laughs> Sounds I good. hear they're really down to earth. So, yeah. 
Um, okay, so let me uh, shift you back to speaker mode. Get ready to do this show that we do. All right. Here we go. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, January 22nd, 2020. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about Meerkat's Deep 2 image, ancient galaxies forming in the, the universe's first stars, uh, what's happening with Chinese exploration, space exploration, and Mars, baby stars found in the ancient part of our galaxy, and we'll talk about the SpaceX Crew Dragon abort test that happened on Sunday. Joining me this week on my screen right now is Carolyn Collins-Peterson. Carolyn. Hey. We've also got uh, Michael Roderick. Michael. Hi, everyone. And uh, Michael, a guest question answers in one of our upcoming episodes. It was great to hang out with you at the uh, at the American Astronomical Society meeting in, yeah, in Hawaii. Uh, and we've also got uh, Alan Versfeld. Alan. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Um, uh, so apparently uh, you guys are having your rainy season. So if if Beetlejuice goes off, you you won't know. Yeah, I'm going to miss it. It'll be... <laughs> I'll have to read about it online. <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> It'll still be bright for like a whole year. So you'll have lots of time. Yeah, that works. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So before we get into the show itself, I just want to give a big shout out, of course, to our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. These are our producers, our fans, our friends. And they are really just the glue that holds this entire show together. So if you want to be a part of this incredible community, become an executive producer of this show uh, and hang out with the rest of the people who do this, go to wshcrew.space. They will hook you up, give you uh, all the information you need, uh, templates to make your business cards, and invite guests onto the show. Uh, I can't wait to interview whoever it is that you invite. So join the Weekly Space Hangout crew, wshcrew.space. And of course, special thanks to Nancy Graziano for all the work that she's been doing behind the scenes. All right, so let's get into this week's special guest, Ken Carpenter. Ken, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Hey, right, thanks for having me. So the question I like to ask people, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> well, um, obviously Dr. Ken Carpenter, I'm at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, just outside of uh, Washington, DC. And um, I have two principal jobs there, one is as the operations project scientist for Hubble Space Telescope, and uh, which is obviously a very mature mission. And, uh, I think I've heard of well it. Well past 29 years at this point. And then to try to balance things out a bit, I work on a new mission that's being built for possible launch in the mid 2020s called WFIRST, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. I'm also a project scientist there concentrating on the ground system and getting it ready uh, to actually operate the telescope once we get it into orbit. Uh, so as a project scientist, I'm, I represent the astronomical community uh, to the project management and make sure that in addition to cost and schedule, they worry about science productivity uh, and the impacts of the decisions they're making. So sort of just a day-to-day -day representative of the professional astronomer community um, within the project management structure. So, so can you explain a little bit more just like how that works? Like like you're the represent you're the representation for scientists who want to be able to use hubble and and sort of to make sure that as they're working on the telescope they they understand what your what scientists needs are right and the, there's actually a, a number of us in each of the projects um but the idea is to have somebody on board that can work with the project on a day-to-day -day basis if we have some huge decision about the future of the mission or how to use it, we will actually go out to the broader community and you know uh, do a, a survey, talk to them, find out what they want. But you can't do that every day. You need you know somebody uh, around that represents the community uh, for the the day to day kind of effort. So um, that's the point. I try to. Uh, I'm also a practicing uh, research astronomer. Uh, actually, study cool evolved stars. So Betelgeuse is is right in my bailiwick. Um, but the idea is that. Uh, to be an effective project scientist, we need to be part of the community that we're representing. 
So uh, we don't get any special treatment on observing time or anything. We have to apply like everybody else. So we get equally frustrated as the rest of the community when you have a six to one over subs subscription rate, but we get to report back uh, to NASA and to the project about how that's going and how we could improve the experience uh, as we go along. Well, I mean, I know a lot of the viewers are, are quite familiar with Hubble. We've spent a lot of time talking about it, um, but probably less familiar with W first and what its capabilities are at the American Astronomical Society meeting. There was a wonderful, huge poster on sort of right outside one of the main halls that showed us sort of a simulation of what we might be able to see with with W first. So uh, for people who aren't familiar, can you give sort of like an overview of, of what W first is and, and, and what it's going to be capable of? Sure. It's uh, it's a very exciting mission that actually uses a telescope that has optics the same size as Hubble, 2.4 meters in diameter. So it's pretty large. It's going to get very high resolution on the sky. But there are two critical differences. The first is that the optics have a different design, and they're designed to do a wide field view of the sky instead of a, a close zoom in. Hubble, uh, James Webb, Spitzer, they've all been telescopes that zoom in on very small areas of the sky at high magnification. W first, although it has the same resolution as Hubble, it can still see fine details on the sky, gets 100 times the view of the sky in a single picture. So something that would take Hubble, a 100 picture mosaic to, to look at, W first can do in a single snapshot. So uh, wide area sky coverage is the first thing. The second is that it's gonna be designed to work mostly in the infrared. Hubble works in the ultraviolet, bluer than what the eye sees, and into the optical where the eye is sensitive. W first is actually going to look to the red of what the eye sees, uh, another range of the spectrum that doesn't get through the atmosphere very well. Um, but once you're in space, like Hubble and W first will be, um, you can actually see these wavelengths. So uh, we're very excited about that. There's other infrared facilities in the sky. Uh, in space, Spitzer is retiring at the end of the of the end of January. That will be replaced by James Webb, hopefully with a launch in spring of 2021, um, and then W first maybe in the mid 2020s. And it would be wonderful to have Hubble, Webb, and W first all operating at the same time. You'll get broader coverage of colors of light if Hubble is still up there and operating with the two infrared telescopes. And then you have two of them zooming in in detail in objects and, and W first able to do these really broad infrared surveys. Um, and the surveys, uh, along with some other uh, capabilities that I'll talk about in a minute, are designed primarily to try to understand what's happening with the expansion rate of the universe. As most of your listeners probably know, the universe is expanding, but we've discovered in recent years that that expansion is accelerating. So instead of slowing down from gravity, pulling back on everything like you would expect, it's actually speeding up with time. It's almost as if you took an apple, threw it into the air, and instead of slowing down and coming back to you, it just keeps going faster and faster upward. And we don't really understand what's doing that, so we call it dark energy. But dark just means mysterious, yeah. not necessarily that it's even black or anything. We just don't know what it is. Um, and we don't, because we don't know what it is and don't have much of a clue as to the actual physics, what we can best do is try to understand its impact on the expansion of the universe and on the shape and motion of objects in the universe more precisely. And we'll take that information, bring it back to the theoreticians and say, okay, this is what we see. What kind of physics can explain this? And we don't really know whether it's just a modification to general relativity that we need or whether it's whole new physics that we're just not uh, understanding at all. Um, so along with a bunch of other telescopes and future projects, W first is going to be studying the expansion in great detail, trying to understand precisely how it's changing with time and distance away from us in the hopes that we'll get enough information so that some brilliant young physicist can actually take that and figure out what the physics is that we're just not understanding at this point. Um, so, so that's the prime. Oh, just, just to interrupt for a second, like, sure. Um, what is this main challenge to being able to really pin down dark energy? You know, and I guess the purpose here, as you're describing it with W first, is to really just provide 
much better data to the astronomers so that they can they can run the calculations with more precision and accuracy. So what is the observation that you, that the astronomers are, are hungry for to be able to to try and punch into their numbers? Because of the criticality of this and because of the, the mysteriousness of it, we're actually approaching it several different ways. One is to um, observe what we call st uh, standard candle supernova stars that explode of a certain type that come to a same maximum brightness or to a maximum brightness that we understand after looking at the light variation. So we look at these standard candles at various distances out in the universe. And by looking at their maximum apparent brightness, we can figure out how far away they are. And we can also measure the speed at which it's receding from us by uh, observing it with spectrographs, graphs. And that combination allows us to plot out speed of recession versus distance from us, and therefore the acceleration as it changes as you go further out. So that's technique one. We also are looking uh, at something called baryon acoustic oscillations, which to simplify it means we're looking at the shape and distortions in galaxies and other extended objects as a function of distance away and position on the sky because the presence of dark energy, we think will impact those shapes and, and distortions. So that's technique number two for measuring the impact of dark energy. And then we also can look at something called uh, uh, microlensing, which uh, measures distortions of light passing by massive objects in the universe, also sensitive to the presence of both dark matter and dark energy. And thanks to that microlensing, WFIRST is actually going to be a planet hunter as well. That's right. That's the second item. And we do that two ways. One is actually using the wide field instrument that's used for all of the surveys. And there we'll, we will take it, point it toward the galactic center where there are millions and millions and millions of stars in the field of view. And what we're looking for are stars in that field of view that have surrounding planets that are in a plane, an orbital plane is right in our line of sight. So as the planets go between us and their target star, they will amplify the light from star, give it a little blip on the light curve. Uh, and we can infer the presence of the planets by their amplification of the starlight behind it. But we have to observe a lot of stars because only some of them have the planets lined up in a direction toward us where we actually see this impact. So looking toward the galactic center is perfect because there's so many stars in, in the galactic bulge. Oh. This will allow us to actually study things at a different, further out from the parent stars than things like Kepler and Tess have been doing. So it complements those missions. It doesn't replace them. Yeah, and, and that's the part that I find really interesting is that like on the one hand, microlensing is is not a repeatable process. You get this one really fortunate lineup. You get this momentary brightness and then you know, and then the the stars are no longer aligned for you and and you don't get to do any follow on observations, especially at those kinds of distances. But at, at the same side, I mean, there are amateurs here on Earth that can use their telescopes to confirm planets using microlensing with just like a six inch telescope. So it's sort of like this incredibly useful, um, very accessible way to find planets. And I love this idea that you can find planets that are that are farther away than than just these little hot Jupiters or these these planets that are orbiting around these these red dwarfs that you've actually got more more distance. So what kind of information would you be able to tease out out of these micro transits as you see them? Well, I think there, I mean, these are going to be very distant objects. We'll be able to get some idea of the orbits and the mass of the objects. We're not going to typically get uh, information on the atmospheres or anything like that. We're not going to be able to resolve with the micro lensing observations. So this is a kind of a planetary census. How many objects are there? how massive are there, how far are they from their parent star typically, and help us to fill out the statistics of planetary systems. There is a second part, a second instrument that's going to be on board W first, in addition to the wide field imager. And this is only there as a technology demonstration, but if it works, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be massive. And it's called a coronagraph. The idea is to have an instrument that you can point at a relatively bright star, and then block out the light of the star so you can see the very much fainter light from surrounding planets. 
And basically, you're looking for light that's reflected off of those planets coming from the parent star, reflecting off the planet and coming to you. Typically, you can't see that even with high resolution telescopes because of the glare from the parent star. So what we're going to be trying out here as part of this technology demonstration is show that it's possible in space to design an instrument that will reject that light from the parent star and it'll let you to see and directly image planets around it. And that, that's a very hard and very rare thing to do. And we're looking uh, to, to reject 10 to the ninth uh, of, of the light around the star. So you want to be able to detect something that's 10 to the minus ninth the uh, the brightness a of the billionth. original star. Is that a trillionth? Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and it's it will try various techniques to do that. There may even be the, the original instrument is designed so everything is built into it to, to occult this. Another technique involves flying a second spacecraft at a very large distance, maybe 20,000 miles further away, and using that to block the light before it even gets to the telescope. That's not in the basic W-first design, but W-first is designed so that if someone were to launch an occult or spacecraft like that in future years, then we would be able to point W-first at it and see if that works any better than the built-in coronagraph. Right. And and ideally, I mean that that idea of the of the star shade is one of my favorite ideas of of uh, the last uh, couple of decades, and I would really love to see one launch. It was great once again at the AAS. They had a couple of different designs for these of different sizes, and the one that's pretty exciting is the one that could come with Habex, which I think was like fifty five meters and would fly like a hundred thousand kilometers away from the mission, and and then work with an onboard coronagraph together to, to just make the planets pop. I got a couple of interesting questions here that I'd love for you to think about. Uh, this comes from David Fairweather. Um, could you find rogue planets this way? You can actually look for rogue planets, but by which I assume you mean planets that aren't orbiting a parent star anymore. And or yes, ever the micro lensing, micro lensing technique with W first will actually detect those, uh, it's about the only easy way to do that because you don't have a background source of light um, to, to see it like you would with a, a transiting um, telescope like TESS or, or Kepler. Um, so the fact that you're doing microlensing and the fact that W first has such a wide field of view means you actually have a decent yeah. chance of finding some of these with a, a telescope like Hubble that only looks at a small postage stamp area of the sky. The odds of actually running across one of these are very low. I mean, it could happen. But W first with 100 times the field of view gives you a much better chance statistically of running across these rogue planets. And we actually do expect to see more than one of those. It's not a one in a million chance. We actually expect to see a number over the course of the mission. Right. And, and that's just literally going to be the chance of some planet out there several thousand light years away happening to pass in front of some other star more thousands of light years away from our perspective, which is just incredible. And I guess the number that you see that will help you just get some sense of just the overall number of them that are that are out there. Precisely, because right now we don't have a, a good way to get a handle on that at right. all. There could be more uh, planets, more rogue planets than regular planets or none <laughs> right. somewhere in between. It would be fascinating to know. I mean, of course, they're not going to be interesting in the sense of looking for life on them because they won't be near uh, a parent star. They're probably not going to be at the right temperature or have a, a you know, good atmosphere for that. But it still be, will be critical, the theories of formation of planetary systems and the galaxy as a whole to, to know how many are out there. Um, and then the other question, uh, this comes from Douglas Smith. There's some news recently that the supernova standard candles are not so standard. That is their metallicity changes as you go back in time. Uh, have you been following this at all? Because it's fairly connected to what you're doing. Right. No, I, I actually saw that news release. At least there was something that came out during the uh, American Astronomical That's Society right, yeah. meeting. Um, and, you know, this is a constant concern. Uh, you know, have we calibrated the standard candles properly? Um, I talked to some folks who are more expert in it than I am, and they're not too worried that this throws out the whole case for dark energy or W first or anything. Uh, it does mean it, it, it's, it does mean we need to very carefully look at this. It's a, a, a result that bears further study for sure. There's no way to, you can't just dismiss it. It looks like a solid result. 
So we want to, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at that in, in more detail for sure. Yeah, it's it's super fascinating. Uh, some people are asking what uh, it's going to be launching on. So how do you plan to go to space? Uh, w first actually does not have a specific launch vehicle oh, yet. yet. Uh, now it's a little early and even a standard mission, but there's also a lot going on in the uh, the booster arena right now. <laughs> it is so, dynamic. You know, it could go on an SLS. It could go on a, a Falcon um, 9 Heavy, uh, maybe even Delta Four Heavy if they're still around. So, uh, you know, we're just waiting to see how the, the, the field develops. And we'll go there because at one point it was looking like one of the commercial vehicles might be a lot cheaper than a standard Delta or not. But you know, how much do you believe the cost estimates yeah. five, six, seven years out at this point when they're still under development? So we'll keep our options open. And, um, you know, if we can save a little money on the launch vehicle, we can do something a little better yeah. on the science instruments or whatever. So we're always looking for opportunities. To yeah, do just that. roll up on a on a starship, just pack it in on the next, you know, on the 345 launch and, uh, you know, and be in space. So so right now, just to sort of set people's expectations, how does the schedule look when when can we expect it to fly and or at least when will we know when it's going to fly? So oh, the, the usual caveat of, of if we're given the <clears throat> expected budget and the, the expected profile over the next uh, five or ten or five years or so, uh, it looks like launch in the mid 2020s is quite feasible. Um, so that's kind of what we're aiming for. We don't uh, have a more precise date than that yeah. um, right now, but we're in. NASA mission development is done in five phases, A, B, C, D, E, and we're in the second phase of that now, which is uh, uh, sort of the design phase. The next phase that we go into uh, soon, we'll actually start building things. Um, and then D is the final completion and E is the operations area where we actually go up and we're hoping to operate for at least five years. And something that's important to, to let people know is that even though we're doing surveys, this is still going to be a fully competed the observing time is still going to be fully competed on w first so the community the full community will have a chance to impact what we do even on the large surveys there may be large teams put together to help decide exactly how we do the surveys what filters we look through with what cadence and that kind of thing will uh, there be there, a like a hubble deep field will there be a version of that for uh, w yeah. first like a, Several, Hubble, like a W first long field or something. I don't know. There, there are going to be deep fields as part of the, the overall surveys. There's a, a high latitude survey, a galactic bulge survey, and then there are specific uh, targeted deep fields at different areas in the sky. And I would bet that uh, about 25% of the program is, is reserved for standard guest observer programs that people will be able to propose to uh, every year or two during the mission. And I would bet you that a lot of those uh, individual proposals are going to be for deep fields in particularly interesting directions. And I'm sure that folks are looking yeah. intently now about you know, where's going to be the best place to get such a deep, broad image. Uh, the and thing the that I'm that I'm really fascinated by, and, and the, the viewers know I'm absolutely entranced by the Vera Rubin Observatory, is just this this era that we're entering of of now seeing the universe, the dynamic universe and how active and how much it changes more than we ever thought that it that it did, you know, what the universe does when it's when we're not looking. And and I've always loved like I really love fast telescopes. And so I think that this is a, a pretty exciting direction to go in, as you said, you know, just like the opposite of Hubble. Hubble is s slow and highly magnified. And this is just wide field, super fast. Someone asked, what's the F, what's the F ratio on the, on W first? You know, I don't actually know that, <clears throat> that answer and I'm not going to quote and give you the wrong one. Well, I can look it up. Find the answer it. while you talk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's the, the sensitivity is, is similar to that in Hubble. It's just that with the, the broad aerial coverage on the sky, the overall uh, discovery factor, as we call it, yeah. is much larger because you have to take way fewer uh, observations to get the, the same amount of data. It one, looks one like thing. it's changing. So it looks like the, the, the actual mirror supplied was 7.8 compared to Hubble's 20, F24. But the actual instruments will change what the final 
depending on the configuration. So yeah, and what what the optics in, in between are. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think it's still I think it's fine to be totally vague still. And it, but it'll be a low number because that, that's how you get the wide field. Yeah. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Ken, if people are want to find out more about what you're working on and what's happening with Hubble and W first, where should they go? Uh, the best place to go is to nasa.gov slash Hubble and nasa.gov slash W first. Those are the, the main pages uh, at NASA for both missions. And then <clears throat> they will link to a whole bunch of secondary sites um, as well. You can, uh, in Hubble's case, where we have existing data, you can actually go in and download uh, images, both ones that are intended as you know, pretty photos to put on your wall, but you can also get to any data that you want. The, the archive is open to the public. You, uh, you, know, you can just go in there, you have to re register to get an account, but once you do that, you can go in and you can actually pull down the science data, or you can just pull down the pictures that have been yeah. curated for, for printing and, and, and whatever. Yeah, there's a um, lot of uh, really great work that's done by, by amateurs that just take science data and turn them into really cool pictures. And I know even NASA will feature some of that, that work that gets done as well. So there's sort of a really great connection between citizen scientists and actual scientists and, and the public. So uh, one, one thing I should mention, it was a huge hit at the AAAS, W first has published plans, and I'm pretty sure you can find it on that website for a 3D printed model. So you can download the, the, the design, and if you happen to have a 3D printer, you can print your own little uh, W first in 3D. Perfect. That's awesome. All it's right. It's been kid tested by some, by some of my colleagues. <laughs> what about dog tested? That's the thing we got to yeah. find out. Well, Ken, thank you so much for joining us on the Weekly Space Hangout this week. Really appreciate it. I can't wait to watch W First launch. It's going to launch. There's going to be no problems, no delays. I, I guarantee it. It's going to be wonderful, and I appreciate your enthusiasm. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Take care. All right. Let's move on to the news portion of the week. Uh, so many uh, interesting news stories. I don't even know where to start. Uh, let's start with uh, Carolyn. Let's talk about what the Chinese are up to with their plans for Mars. Yeah, so this is really interesting. Um, I, I first got interested in the Chinese space program a couple of years ago. I wrote that book about space exploration. And I was digging around trying to find more about the, the Chinese space program. And, and as you and I have talked about, it's a little hard to get real hard details on yeah. some things. Um, and their program is proceeding along with a number of missions. Uh, just in the last day, they've dumped a whole bunch of um, lunar images from the Chang'e 4 lander, which I'm starting to go through now so I can write an article about that. Um, they've had their Tiangong Space Station program, which had, uh, as you recall, the last one sort of burned up in the atmosphere. And they're now got a next generation space, pro space station that they're testing the main component for. They're building other components for it, and they're hoping to get that up within the decade. And... Um, there's also a Mars mission. And so I want to talk a little bit more about the Mars mission today. Um, later this year, they're going to be launching probably in July or August. It's not clear yet when that is. The, the Chinese National Space Agency will launch a global remote sensing orbiter and small rover. And they have a temporary name for it. And I learned how to pronounce it. It's Washing. Washing. Oh, Washing. <laughs> it's um, funny. I've got like, I'm like at some point there'll be blooper reels of me trying to. All of us trying to say this. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. Like the <laughs> uh, the the relay spacecraft for the yeah. Mars. So it's it's Chow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it and but it does, but it's got cues in it. And like, so it took me a while to like you know you run across in the script. You're like, how do I say this and not feel like a fool? Well, so, yeah. luckily there are like million little places on it on the web where you can get Mandarin. Mandarin uh, That's exactly pronunciations. It. Yeah. So it's it, the best I can do is washing. Washing. Um, okay. And it actually is the word for Mars, and it's a temporary name. So you know they'll probably give it a, a more permanent name at some point. But it'll be launched this summer, and it'll land in 2021. And it's a remote sensing orbiter and a small rover that will, and the rover will land on the planet. And between the two of them, they have something like 12 instruments. There'll be two cameras on the, on the orbiter. There's a high resolution and medium resolution one. Radar instrument to study the subsurface to penetrate in a few centimeters. There's also a spectrometer to do some mineralogy from our orbit, orbit a magnetometer to track magnetic field variations. And particle analyzers, I'm assuming to see about interactions with the solar wind most likely 
Um, the rover will have a multispectral camera that'll give it uh, the capability to do imaging at different wavelengths. It'll have spectroscopy instruments, uh, ground penetrating radar itself, and other instruments that will study the, the local climate and the local magnetic environment. And they'll both work together at times and at other times they'll be working separately. Um, the rover is tentatively planned to land somewhere in Utopia Planitia. They haven't exactly said where yet, but they've identified two possible sites. And I, this is kind of interesting because one of the studies they're going to do is to study the, the ground ice. <clears throat> Utopia Planitia does have this uh, big mass of ground ice that they could be studying, underground ice. So the current plan is that the Chinese are testing the instruments as the spacecraft goes through integration right now. And they did send, show some images late last year of a, a practice landing with a model of their, of their spacecraft, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, they're still testing, they were testing until last December, their Long March 5 rocket, which is the heavy lift instrument that'll be, or rocket that'll be taking it up to space. And that was late December, they tested that. And they're going to be using a variation on the Long March 5, which is a Long March 5 Y4. And they're, uh, did a booster engine test on that, I think, in the last week. So the pieces and parts of the mission are falling into place for the Chinese. It's now just kind of like for everybody else who sends something to Mars, getting it all put together and getting it there safely. Um, and it's pretty heavily science oriented. The Chinese have offered to share this data with anybody who's interested. That's great. Um, and it's also a precursor and a pathfinder for a sample return mission, which they're planning maybe for the 2030s. And what they might do is gather samples with this mission in particular with Washing, and then uh, leave them there for later retrieval by whatever comes next. Mm -hmm. That's a similar plan to what <coughs> NASA is is planning to do with the European Space Agency. So yeah, yeah. Uh, the next rover, which you can name now, um, go mm -hmm. vote, um, is going to be deploying samples, pooping samples out onto the uh, onto the surface <laughs> yeah, of, of Mars. Yeah. Uh, the European uh, the European uh, Rosalind Franklin rover is going to be doing the same thing. And then in theory, a collaboration between NASA and Europe is going to bring some some samples right, back right. back home to to Earth. And it's interesting that the Chinese are, are putting together a fairly similar similar operation. I mean, yeah, it looks pretty ambitious. I mean, and, and everybody that's going to Mars is, of course, going after the same scientific goals, you know, whether, yeah, you know, pretty much figure out what it's going to be like when we actually send more complex missions, when we send more people there. Um, I'm sure that they have pretty, you know, pretty long range plans to send people there, just like as we all do. So uh, what I see this really being is them stepping up to the plate and becoming like, joining the, the big rocket club, you know, let's, let's go do this. Let's, let's go to Mars and everybody else is going to Mars. We're going to, we're going to do it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, they, I, I mean, I don't know if people are, are really aware of this. I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but, but the Chinese launched more rockets last year than yeah. any other country in the world. So, so they're the number one rocket launch provider. I mean, probably yeah, and it took them a while too, because they had some problems uh, with, yeah. with the Long March series. It took them quite a while to, to work that out. But well, you know, once they got it right, they're just sending them up there like yeah. crazy. I mean, they're dropping their boosters in villages and, and so on, you know, but you know, <laughs> well, yeah. got it, you know, like omelets, eggs and omelets. Um, although, no, I don't know, did you see the, um, the design for their, I think it's the Long March 8, which is going to be their new reusable version yeah, of the Long yeah. March. Uh, it has, it looks like a Falcon 9, obviously, yeah. but it has um, sort of permanently attached boosters along the side of the central yeah. core, but it does have these deployable legs and it lands in a, looks like it lands on like almost like an oil platform out in the ocean. So yeah, yeah. that will be a huge benefit to to not having these rockets drop in people's towns they have to evacuate every time they launch these, yeah, more yeah. these long marches because the that first booster stage comes down on land which is well you know they they're they're really um you and i were talking earlier about how tough it is to get information about them i mean they're very proud of what they're doing obviously and the several times i've been over there to talk to people about things they'll talk to a certain extent about their space program not everybody i'm talking to has all the information i mean it's still being kind of held close to the chest higher up than the people i've been talking to but even people on the street know about this and it's really fostering a big interest in more science education more science outreach they're kind of like what we saw in the 60s with the, the apollo program 
but they have the benefit of, you know, 50 years now of, of knowledge that, that they can build on. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I hope, you know, the, the best case scenario I hope is that we get a, like a beneficial space race of science yeah. where, where, you know, that sort of rise in science and technology that's happening, the, the emphasis that's placed on it helps restore some of the, mm -hmm. maybe the loss of science or the, the loss of enthusiasm for science that I think a lot of us feel here in the, in the West. So I think that would be, that would be great to just sort of see that. Yeah. Yeah, I hope no, it doesn't go in the bad way, right? Where it just becomes sort of what happened with the cold war and, you know, with, with it being like the fact that, that they are offering to communicate their information back yeah. and make it publicly available. And, and I think with the moon, with the moon mission so far, they have been a lot more oh, yeah. public yeah. Yeah. and, and accessible than, than they were in the past. It's been, yeah, it my rough. sense of it as a person on the street has been that there is that interest, um, but all of the big decisions and the, the saber rattling and all that kind of is all way above our pay grade yeah. for all of us. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is this their first, uh, their first mission to another object other than the moon? Like, are they just going straight to Mars, straight to rovers? Yeah, they're, they're yeah, I think so. They are planning on going to an, an asteroid as well. I'm not sure the time frame on that though. That's impressive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, there's no new ideas in rocket science, okay? So they're they're basically taking everything that we've all learned, and, and they've been watching it. There's, you know, they're not dumb. They're going to watch all this happen, and and build on it and move forward. And that's why I really hope we'll have a lot of you know international cooperation on this at some level, because the science is the science, and we all can learn from it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you no, know, you're exactly right, though. It is it is impressive to to just skip all the intermediate steps and just send a a rover lander combo. Well, look what right happened with India. Gate. First one they send and they just hit it out of the park. Yeah, absolutely. With the Mars orbiting mission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, at a fraction of the price and yeah, uh, just a yeah. wildly successful mission. And, and India and India is, is crushing it as well. I mean, they've gotten mm -hmm. so good at what they do as well. So, yeah, so it's, it yeah. just feels great. It feels great to see all of these nations, all of this capability. I, I rant about it all the time, but it really does feel like we're in the golden age of, of both astronomy and, and space exploration. And, and it should continue. Let's and hope it, so. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. And, and like I said, in the good way. Um, yeah. Alan, what do you got? Hi, hi. Yes, so um, the Meerkat uh, radio telescope, uh, which is South Africa's precursor to the Square Kilometer Array, uh, they've recently released an image of, uh, they're calling it Deep 2, and it's kind of equivalent to, do you remember the Hubble Deep Field, uh, deep field image from, when was that? Basically looking at a dark area of sky and picking up thousands and millions of objects. Similar thing, uh, except this is in radio wavelengths at about 1.28 gigahertz or so. And what's uh, what they the, the way that they, they're promoting it is that this is the first image of what they call the cosmic noon, which is the period in the universe's history when most of the stars that we see today were were forming, and it's the first time that these stars have ever been seen in radio wavelengths. Uh, in fact, I believe it's the first time they've been observed directly at all. In regular galaxies, uh, you know your your, your super bright, uh, rapid forming galaxies aside, the rare ones. These are the common galaxies, the ones like like our Milky Way. Um, yeah, uh, these these things are most about eight to eleven billion years ago. But so it's the first observation. But what I find interesting about this is that the way they were, you get the hint from reading the, reading the paper about it, so that this is almost more a technical milestone for them. You know, the telescope was only was only officially launched in July last year, but the observations took place before the official launch, um, early 2018 to 2019. There were 12 separate observations totaling about 160 hours of data. And they talk a great deal about the calibration. I mean, the, the, uh, I don't think it's normal for a science paper to spend so much time talking about the calibration and the debugging of the instruments, you know? Yeah. So I think this is actually a bit of a technical milestone. And I think they are almost almost showcasing what the instrument is capable of. Uh, um, Meerkat yeah. is, is a pretty amazing instrument, um, as you mentioned, you know, precursor to the square kilometer array. There mm. are sort of these two facilities that are set up, one in in South Africa with Meerkat and then another in, in Australia, sort of approaching different ways to try to, to 
figure out how this square kilometer array will come together. And in the end, it's going to be both, right? There's going to be part of it built mm -hmm. in Australia and part of it built in, in South Africa. But, but the South Africans uh, came, you know, developed a lot of really interesting techniques to be able to kind of push this, this array concept forward. And so to see these images of the universe at such an early age from the ground is a, just mm. a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, why are we using a radio telescope to see stars? The problem is that this is, uh, these stars are not visible directly in visible. <laughs> yeah. They can't be seen directly in visible lights uh, because they are obscured by, by, by dust clouds. And uh, whereas with um, these frequencies, which are, it's not infra. You know, we normally look look through through dust in, in infrared, uh, like uh, to see what's happening in the Orion Nebula, or what have you. But you can carry it down all the way into radio uh, wavelengths, and obviously these stars are too far away to to resolve individual stars. But we are seeing the starlight directly coming from these galaxies about eight to eight to eleven billion years away, uh, light years away. Wow. <laughs> And and so I mean, I mean, it's the same thing, same idea with the cosmic microwave background, right? That 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 mm -hmm. the they're so far away and so far back in time and they're moving so far away so fast quickly away from us that the wavelengths are getting stretched and so you're actually yes. you know you're you're using radio to see something that would have been farther up the electromagnetic spectrum exactly yeah you would when have, the light yeah. was emitted but now it's just been stretched right out mm. um uh, and it's the first time we've ever managed to to see these the, um see these at the state of their evolution and like, how long has Meerkat been going for? It's a pretty new observatory, right? Yeah, well, I mean, these, these I mean, they've been active for a couple of years. Um, uh, they were officially launched in July last year. So it's only about six months, six or seven right. months old, uh, officially. Yeah. But these observations took place from about, well, let me check about, about April 2018 to, to early 2019. So it's almost a year's worth. Um, yeah, I mean, construction's been going on for years and years. Of course, yeah. it's, a, it's a big project, yeah. but uh, yeah, you officially launched recently. Yeah, you mentioned in your article, right? Sixty-four dishes, each one thirteen point five meters across, which is mm. just it's an, huge. It's huge. Yeah, it's an enormous yeah. number. So it's uh, it's great. Have you had a chance to actually see the the observatory? Have you been able to go out there? I haven't. No, it's you know, it's, it's such a remote area, and. Uh, to get that, first I have to fly to Cape Town, and then I'd have to to hop on a car. And it's, it's not just open to the public; you know, you have to arrange a tour. Well, and... you're a journalist; you should be able to get a tour. Well, I'm, you know, I've, I've only officially had that label for a short while, even though I've been doing this as an amateur for years. But yeah, but no, that that's definitely on my to do list. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. We should do some kind of collaboration with University Today. Anytime you want, let me know. I'll I'll see what kind of strings I can pull to help you get uh, behind the scenes. That'd be amazing. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. Talk to you after the show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thanks, Alan. Michael. Yes. So we have uh, baby stars that we found in the halo of our galaxy. Uh, so these are unusual because they seem to be associated with something called the Magellan Extreme, which is this uh, kind of tail of gas associated with the Magellanic clouds. And it's really curious, actually, how we found these. Um, so these researchers were looking through Gaia data. And Gaia is very good at measuring positions, and it can get proper motions. And so if you look at a bunch of stars in our galaxy, they probably have random motions associated with each other. So they're not all moving together. They're kind of random with respect to each other. But when they saw these objects, they found a clustering of objects that were actually moving all in the same direction. And so when you see that, that's a really good indication that these are actually spatially together, that these live together in some kind of cluster or group. And they actually found two, two clusters. One, they're, they're separated from each other. They picked the larger cluster to do um, follow-up studies with. So they had the original Gaia data. They had Gaia photometry. They saw this really cool cluster in this Magellan Extreme. And they did more observations with a dead cam uh, imager uh, in Chile. And from that, they're able to actually construct uh, something called an isochrone, which means that they're able to essentially map out the age of these stars. And they found that they're only about 100 million years old, which astronomically speaking is pretty young, which means that these appear to have actually formed in this stream of gas. 
in the halo in this Magellanic stream. Uh, so it's very unusual, very unexpected place to find these young stars in our galaxy. Um, so, I mean, the way I had seen that described was like, essentially, we're already like, we're going to be colliding with the Magellanic clouds. And this is sort of an, the era of star formation from this collision has already begun. Right. So when you have objects that are colliding, um, any gas that's associated with those objects can become compressed. And so you have this really diffuse gas, which uh, undergoes gravitational compression. That can then lead to this burst of star formation, which seems to be what we're seeing right here, that this is what's going to happen even more, more common when, you know, Milky Way collides with Andromeda, that we're probably going to get this burst of star formation as all this gas clouds compress and you get these bursts of star clusters that are forming everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, how does this compare to what we could expect to see when the Magellanic clouds actually do fall into the galaxy? Uh, so this is a much smaller scale. So I think, in fact, there are only a few thousand stars that they found. <laughs> Still uh, a lot. A few. Th you it's know, a few, lot, but a few when you compare it to like new the... stars forming from from tidal interactions between us and and uh, the Magellanic cloud. Right. Um, yeah, it should be much, much bigger numbers, much easier to, uh, if their astronomers are still still there on Earth back, you know, way in the future, they should have a lot more data to play around with than just these little tiny puny clusters. Um, um, the, the, I mean, the Large Magellanic Cloud actually has a lot more interesting star formation in it than even, say, the Milky Way does, right? You've got like things like the, tar the Tarantula Nebula and some really some monster stars. So is that... Are we doing that to, to the cloud? That's a good question. I don't know specifically yeah. about the Magellanic cloud. I would assume that it it should because I mean you're undergoing these tidal forces within uh, within this Magellanic cloud, and that is known to produce star formation. So I think it's reasonable to say yeah. that yeah, that is that is what's causing it. Okay. Well, if you if you write a paper on that, uh, put, <laughs> put my name on there. Um, right. uh, so I, are we certain now that that the Magellanic clouds are going to merge with the Milky Way? Is it is it pretty much a slam dunk at this point? I think it's pretty, pretty certain that that's going to happen. Um, I don't know the exact time scale for it, but yeah. yeah, these are just little small satellite galaxies orbiting us. Eventually, they should decay and fall uh, into the center of the galaxy or the plane of the galaxy, I should say. And I guess the, the point is that it's kind of an interesting detective work, which is that you look for newly forming stars in places where they shouldn't be. It's almost like the, you know, you're seeing the, I don't know, the wreckage of a collision or something. You're seeing the scene after the crime, and then you're using that to infer that there is some kind of either some kind of past collision happened over there, or it's happening right now. And you just have to find the, you know, what's going on. Right. And the other weird thing about this is that it's, uh, like this isn't a very dense area. This is very kind of loose, sparse region where you have these stars forming. And so we would expect that you should find stars forming in dense regions of H1 of hydrogen gas, where there's a big reservoir for these stars to form. But we're not seeing that in this case. It seems that maybe in the past there was, but presently we're not seeing that large amount of, uh, of hydrogen gas. So to, to plug my own research, you know, I'm also looking at mergers of galaxies, tidal tails, like star clusters of tidal tails. So it's a similar kind of thing that you have these diffuse regions of material uh, where we are seeing these uh, newly formed star clusters forming within these diffuse regions where there, there is not as much gas as you could, would compare it to like the centers of these systems. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Sure. Uh, um, all right, so before we go, I just want to point your attention, of course, we, uh, we finally had the, um, the, the in-flight abort test of the Crew Dragon, the SpaceX Crew Dragon, and it had originally be scheduled for Saturday morning, uh, but I let them know that that was too early for me, that I wanted to sleep in, so they rescheduled it for Sunday morning. Uh, they clearly didn't get the memo, uh, so I said, no, 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 I want to sleep in until about 7 30 
on my time on Sunday morning as opposed to 4 a.m., which was their original plan. So they pushed back the launch for me, and then I woke up, and there it was. The rocket was launching, and I want to sort of show you the launch, and uh, it's possible that it wasn't done for me. But anyway, uh, so let's watch the uh, let's watch the launch here. Zero. Ignition, lift off, set for five, aim high, go Falcon, go Dragon. So of course this is, yeah, this this is a right. test of a way to make sure that astronauts can escape if their rocket explodes. And, uh, and this is sort of the final big test that the Dragon had to be able to, to demonstrate. And so they go to the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Two plus 30 seconds, pressure. Falcon 9 with the Crew Dragon oh, capsule is here. heading east from pad 39A. Yeah, so they get to the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure, which is sort of like the scariest time of the entire flight. A time when the rocket still has a ton of fuel, the, the capsule is being hit by all kinds of aerodynamic forces. And so in this case, they... they uh, they tested out, they fired the eight Super Draco engines. Vehicle is supersonic and passing through right, maximum so dynamic should, pressure. Uh, we should You've heard go. we're supersonic, we're through max Q. Yeah, just we're a second We're getting ready here. now to it's throttle the go. engines back up on the we'll first stage. This. Stage one, throttle up. There's the call out. Okay, the major activity coming up in just over 10 seconds. Shut down and Dragon escape from the Falcon 9. And there it goes. Miko, Dragon launch escape initiated. Dragon's away. And you can hear some really loud uh, cheering in the room. Okay, you just saw a bright flash there. It looks like Falcon that may be Falcon 9 breaking up. Um, all right, let me shift this back here for my co-hosts yeah so the 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 test went perfectly uh they took off they they fired the thrusters the the falcon 9 rocket exploded tumbled and exploded so uh someone's saying in the chat it, it was already used three times so you know it had already uh was a pretty hard working booster rocket the capsule deployed its parachutes landed in the ocean they recovered it nicely one big surprise was that the actual the trunk section landed in the ocean and they were able to recover it in one piece, which was actually pretty surprising. So at this point, it looks like Crew Dragon is is ready to go for March 2020. We're just a couple of months before the first two astronauts uh, drive to the rocket in a Tesla Model X, get in the Crew Dragon and fly to the International Space Station. And for the first time since 2011, the United States will have the ability to send their astronauts to the space station, which is pretty exciting. Uh, Horizon Brave is noting in the comments, Boeing, your move. Uh, absolutely, we've seen a, a sort of half test from Starliner. So I think it's gonna be a little while before Starliner does the same job. All right, we reached the end of our show. Michael, you're on my screen. Uh, where can people find more? So I'm on Twitter at Michael Roderick. I also have my website at sites.psu.edu slash mroderick. You can look at my research there. Right on. Carolyn. Well, you can find me at thespacewriter.com online, and I'm on Twitter at, at spacewriter, although I haven't been using that as much lately, and I'm trying to get back to it, so... There you go. Well, there you go. You just made a public commitment that you were going to. So yeah. now, it, now you got it's got to happen. Um, I'm sure people will free, feel free to less uh, politics, more science. <laughs> uh, UBU, uh, Alan. Yeah, I'm on Twitter also at U Astronomer, um, and the Urban Astronomer podcast will be launching again end of February, season three. And you Excellent. can see my writing at uh, yeah at Space in Africa, uh, which is AfricanNews.space. Fantastic. And of course, an upcoming profile on the Meerkat Array from on the scene. I hope so, yeah. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so as I mentioned at the start of the show, I'm going to be going and doing a uh, virtual star party with Skylius over on her Twitch channel. We'll be uh, operating a telescope live and we'll see what's in the night sky. 
so if you want to see that, go to uh, twitch.tv slash Cares. And if you are, are listening to this in podcast form, I'm sorry. You can watch the uh, the video on demand after afterwards. Uh, we've got a new question show coming out tomorrow uh, with uh, uh, a special question on Beetlejuice, which is going to be great. Uh, we've got... Uh, another episode on the future of gravitational wave astronomy coming out on Friday. So stick around. Lots more good content. All right, let me put everybody back on the screen. Here's us. As always, uh, thank you everyone for watching us live. Thank you to the moderators. Thank you to all of the great people at the WSH crew, uh, our special guest. We couldn't do this with uh, without all of you participating. So uh, we will see you all. Oh, there we go. So it's twitch.tv slash Skylius. There we go. Apologies. Uh, that's the channel. So people put links. So join me after this. All right. We'll see all of you uh, next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> and press the stop button. <laughs>